The basics, and this isn't the only set of basics, obviously. Two types of clippers, generally. This is called a double action. It has two hinges in it. The one I use mostly is a single action. As I said, I put these in, in the bag so they know they're disinfected. I'll pass these around. A single action is just a workhorse. It goes through anything. It's what I use most of the time. Uh, these two instruments, which is why I package them together, a curette and the, what I call the basic clipper are my two basics for every patient. Uh, I've gone through periods of time where I've used the double action, but that's more, it's actually a bone cutter in surgery. Um, it, that's why it's a lot more expensive. It's an actual surgical grade instrument. These don't have to be surgical grade. They just have to be stainless steel so that you can disinfect them properly. They can't be chrome. Um, so I, I used to use that in facilities where I couldn't use a sander because you can go through thicker nails with that. If you use a three-wee, it's not an issue. You can get through thicker nails with that three-wee liquid that I showed you before. Okay? So I'm going to just pass those around. Most of you see seen those. Uh, curettes, a dermal curette is like a little bit. It's coming around too. There are hundreds of types of dermal curettes. There's only one type that works really well for this. It's a relatively sharp edge that's 1.5 centimeters on one side, millimeters, excuse me, on one side and two or three millimeters on the other side. Okay? We talked about the fact that if you're not trained to cut nails the way we do it as podiatrists, you should cut them straight across. That's the safest way. But what we want to, sh to shoot for once you're proctored is, especially in the big nail we're talking to, to round that tip for several reasons. Cut it all the way down to the side, excuse me. The reasons are, like we talked about, if you don't round it down, those edges will grow up within a week or two and start scratching the adjacent leg, pulling on socks, and they have to come back sooner for care, which they can't do. Usually two months to three months, sometimes more, is how often people can come back for care, depending on different issues. But the, the trick here is, when you're cutting this, you have to realize that the skin hides the edge of the nail. And if you go as far as you think it the nail is, you can leave that spike. And that spike's what we saw earlier in those nail removal pictures. That's the spike. It doesn't grow out enough to cause an ingrowth for about two weeks. But as that nail advances, it becomes a lance that, that cuts into the skin, which allows bacteria to pour in, and that's an ingrown toenail, and we caused it. So that's why it's safer to cut creative cedar costs until you are proctor done. You want to make sure that the tip of the thing, this is not a good picture, goes all the way to the edge of the nail. Now, in this foot, you can see the edge of the nail. You can't always. Uh, oh, this is our class. I forgot I put this on. So here we're practicing in class at the senior center on inanimate objects. With the cutters, we have plastic grips that we use to, to use it. There's different methods for using the clippers. Uh, we use balsa wood for the dremels. Um, and then I go around and then everybody's working. I say, now what I wanted you to do here was this. So that's pictures from our hands-on class. Oh, that is true. They're all looking at the frowny, but I don't know if you <laughs> Okay, so the instruments. The clipper I'm passing around and the curette and also a small clipper, which I, we're not passing around now. It's just a smaller version in case there are tiny little spots you just can't get into. With these three, you can pretty much do anything. And I rarely have to use this. I can get into really small corners with that basic clipper. But those are your three basics in my training. See, only nurses can do this or can do um, like, like pig's feet to brightman while they're eating and, and <laughs> drinking coffee. This is a nurse thing. Okay. So you see how she's buried the tip under there. The tip is all the way to here. She knows she has to get that because that's where it wasn't grown. So she gently, this doesn't hurt. If, if, a, if it hurts, if they're not frankly ingrown, foot care doesn't hurt. Even when I do it, it's my bad. Unless it's frankly ingrown and painful before you start it. And I do. We pinch, we scratch, it happens. So in a case like this, that was terribly painful. It didn't, wasn't hurt. I wouldn't have been taking pictures if the patient was in pain. They do, and they're not neuropathic. Our population there at the Center are not neuropathic. Most of them. They can have diabetes, but most of them are not neuropathic. So that looks horrible. She didn't feel a thing. We did it carefully. We did it so we didn't poke her with it. And we got down where we needed to go. It was curved under like that. We had to get back to there. 
Then we take the dremel, or before, we take the dremel. I use this sanding disc. Uh, it's just what I learned with. I think it's extremely versatile, but it takes a little bit of training. The things we passed around, did we pass around the dremels? Yeah. Are the diamond burr and one of the other barrel sanders. There's a lot of pieces you can use, all kinds of things. It's no right or wrong. It's whatever you learn with and you learn to manipulate. I was taught with this. I was really good with it because I learned it 25 years ago. Anything you learn that you're good at. So I'm not saying there's one thing that's good or bad. Um, but I teach them how to do the calluses on the side there, how to get the nail down. So it goes from that to that. Most of you in this room are doing nail cuttings. The question is always how thick, how thin do we make it? Well, this class, for instance, that we're doing is a training class, and the patients know it. They know we're going to go way down lower than you need to go, because part of my job is letting you as the nurses know it's okay. Not some horrible thing is going to happen. It's just skin under there. So I go down further than you ever need to with the patient's consent. We have patients who don't want to, and we don't. We respect that. But it's just to show you this. I would never do that normally, because it's not, it's not cosmetic, and I want it to look nice. But it's to show you there's just skin under there. It's okay. And that's not finished, by the way. And we can get that down with a sander in about five minutes. You have to watch your heat. You have to watch a number of things. So here is that same one on the side. First of all, look at the little ulcer here from when this nail was bigger. Okay. The other thing I want to show with this, we carefully took this down to the skin level. And look how uneven that is. Because the nail was pressing on it in such a way that it made those ripples. It was pressing uneven. Within half an hour or an hour of us taking all the nail off, just like this, that will round out. That's not a permanent nail or skin change. That's just from pressure of that nail by the shoe, which is why we have to take these down. It's pressing on the skin and the underlying phalanx and causing a possibility of infection. So that we had to do it really carefully to show that. So you used three we up there. I didn't. I don't. Because I use my sander. You don't use three with a sander. I don't. Do you? Yeah. It, you can't sand well. So I don't. In the class, we don't use this. So it gets dummy. Huh? It gets dummy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, more of that. Another, this isn't the same nail, but it's just skin. What you have to watch for, let's go back one, is when you're sanding it down from that, you don't know that the skin is like that. So you're happily sanding down, sanding down, and you get this high point. We're ready for that. Then it bleeds. Mm -hmm. It's a scratch. It's not a big deal. You're going to treat it. You're going to medicate it. You're going to stop the bleeding. You're going to put medicine. It's fine. I'm not saying we want to do that. I'm not saying it isn't an owie for the patient, and they certainly don't appreciate it. But I'm saying it's safer to do it than not to do it. So what I always teach is, we think that the nail is rounded like you can kind of tell that is. We think that the skin underneath must be flat and it's just the nail is rounded. And sometimes that's true. Normally it's not. Normally the nail, the skin is rounded too. So you're trying to sand, sand, sand to make this flat, not realizing the skin isn't flat. So if you go down from the top, you can only go so far. And you kind of have to work with somebody to learn where your parameters are. What you can do is go from the side. There's no such problem on the side, and the side is where it gets ingrown. So what I teach is to use whatever sander bit you're using, I don't care, and take everything you possibly can off of the side, because then it can't get ingrown. Even if you haven't been successful at cutting it back, because it's tight, because the patient's in pain, whatever, you can sand it so thin, easily, without any pain, that the nail can't get ingrown as it advances because it's thinner than the skin. It's, it's softer than the skin, I guess is a better way to put it. In some of the really thick nails, that, I mean, that, that one looks like a really hard consistency, but some of them that are softer and crumblier, is it impossible that little bits of flesh and little capillaries kind of grow up in there? No. Capillaries and flesh never grow up into nails. It does not happen. Mm -hmm. It Even happens like this. It's soft and crumbly. Doesn't happen. Can't happen. Gotcha. Absolutely not. Capillaries do not grow up into nail tissue. Doesn't happen. 
But what can happen, and what you might be interpreting, is a little piece of tissue has grown up into a crack. Oh. But an isolated vessel can't do that. It's not physically possible. Right, no, it's tissue. But you can have a little piece of tissue exactly like this. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yes, that is possible, and that happens all the time. Yes. Okay. So that's not pretty, is it? You're thinking, how do I do that? One piece at a time, right? If we're doing the clipping, you can just start anywhere you can reach and just start clipping little baby bites. How does a beaver take a tree down? One bite at a time. It doesn't matter how big those clippers are, you use about two millimeters of the blade. That's it. Clip, 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 clip. Little bites. And so I'm going to start anywhere I can. Doesn't matter. This, well, this is from our class, that's why. So this, we didn't know what was going on here. See it? We didn't know if that was a bruise or what. And I'm nervous, and it's in a senior center, and I have no ability to follow up. But I examined it, and I kind of swallowed my heart and said, okay, I think this is going to be okay. I think it's macerated. I think we're okay. And thankfully we were. That you should not, don't do this at home. If you see something that that's unclear, you can do that nail, gently, do some of it, and send them on. But I did. So, let's see show. So we sanded it, and we sanded it, and we sanded it, and we sanded it, and we got it down. It had been a bruise that had leaked and macerated the skin. You can still see part of the bruise. I stopped there. There was no ulcer. I got lucky. I, I understand that. There was no ulcer. There was no infection. There was nothing. And I did all that before I could touch the nail, because I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> we'll see. And then we started the nail. Oh, there's a side piece. So we got all the way down. It's safer that way. I know our local podiatrist in Issaquah will not do this. End of story. And so I took that upon myself because I knew I could find her wound here, but I couldn't find a podiatrist to take this off if I failed. I'm a physician. Don't try this at home. I, I took quite a risk to do that. So same person, same person, I just took lots of You have that nail off. Did we show you mm -hmm. the nail? Oh yeah, so we took the nail off too. That's the same foot. Now we're taking the nail off. That's the end of, so that's the, from there, that was the end. I should have switched those. So we sanded it down. That whole nail just sanded right down. That took like two minutes. So I don't clip those. I sand those. A big sander. So we just sand and I let the nurse do that. I did the skin part because I didn't want anybody liable but me. And I gave her the Dremel and she did the rest of it, just boom, boom. So it went from that to that. And that took more than two minutes because of the rest of the procedure, but, okay. I'm getting different looks. Mm -hmm. All right, calluses. Uh, a lot of people use this. It's a, it's a kind of scalp, uh, <coughs> razor blade. If you're good at it, use it. Don't start using something you've never used. I would never try that. They have new uh, debridement thing, which is a, it's a bendable, what's it called? It's a bendable scalpel. It's like a long thing and it has a grip, plastic grips on both sides. And the nurses where I work are really good at it. They pinch them together and just scalpel away. I tried it once, cut people. Don't try, I can't even do it with a 10 blade. Because as a surgeon, I used to use a, I learned to use a 15 blade. If I try to do your calluses with a 10 blade, I will cut you. My hand hand coordination is geared after 25 years to a 15 blade. So don't try something you haven't done or not being proctored with, okay? She talked earlier about a thing called a gouge or a gouge, which is what the nurses use in Canada. And it's a funny scalpel that's V-shaped and that's how they get out their uh, IPKs and their parakeratosis. I tried it once because I teach up there and I, <laughs> thank God it was an inanimate object. I couldn't get it <laughs> right and they're good at it. So whatever you learn with is what you use your whole career. There's no right or wrong. It's whatever you're trained with. Oh, here's another one from class. So this is a different kind of pinch callus. This is nothing to do with pronation. This has to do with chubby feet. So we got that off the same way. We just sanded that off. And it was a ridge. Let's go back. It's this ridge here. And that's a fold. So we had to not just do it flat. We had to sand that ridge down on its side. And then we did the nail. But you can see it wasn't quite done yet because, like I said, I'll do some of the, the nurse was doing this one, uh, I'll, we'll do some of the callus and then wait for it to harden back up. We'll go do something else on the nail because I don't know how much we have left to go. So that's why this isn't finished there when we're already doing part of the nail. We go back and forth. 
The other reason to go back and forth is with any sander that builds up heat. And you have to do whatever, you'll get a sense for what you can do without too much heat. Depends on your RPMs you're using and what device you're using. So we might have done that for a while and gone to here and let that cool down and go back and forth so that the heat is not a problem because the heat is no fun for the patient. It burns them. It's instantaneous and it's gone, but they do not like it. If you do it too much, they will not come back. So that's why you see half of each thing done. And that's part of being faster, too. If you focus on one thing till it's done and then another thing until it's done, it's going to take you longer to do the care than if you go back and forth in a pattern that makes sense. So that's the neo before and after. And you can see that was all covered up before. Now, there again, at this senior center, they know we're going to do this. You have to work with your patients because this is going to be tender for a few days. This is skin that has been covered and not touched, and now it's going to be exposed. So it's going to be tender in the shoes. The patients know this. I talk to them about it. And if they don't want it done, we don't do it. Respe we respect them beyond the fact this is a class. So be careful when you go back. I'm not saying you have to, be careful, that you have to not do it. I'm just saying be careful and warn them. This is going to be a little tender in your shoes, but you're going to be able to go much longer before you have to come back. So just work with them on it. And if they don't want you to do it, respect it and maybe stop less. The problem was that was all gritty in there, and we kind of had to do that to get all that flaky stuff off. Is that still the name? That's yeah, the this? stuff underneath? Yeah, that's still... usually a harder... The yeah. hard part is until back here, because this is all fungal. Okay. So we had to sand, sand, sand. That's all the nail, though. Yeah, that's all nail. Uh, this is a before and after, a more traditional foot. I'm not really happy that wasn't the final, because I don't like the fact this is sticking up like that. That's fine today, but as it grows out in two weeks, that's going to catch on their socks. So I tell the students, you have to think two weeks into the future. That looks fine today. It's not. It's smooth. It's not going to catch anything. But it looks junky. It's not straight across in a way that's cosmetically acceptable. And you've left things like this and this that are going to go out in a very short period of time and catch. So that's what you have to think about too. How is this in the future as this grows out? So this is not acceptable. This but on that, that on that weird cut one, it may be attached that far, and you would be cutting yeah. to the, you would be cutting the quick if you good point. Made it so serious. what you can't leave it like this. So you have to decide in advance that you kind of see that you can kind of tell that's what's happening, and either cut it across, not sand it where it, it's more even. Or once it's like this, the only thing we could do was use the sander to thin this down to skin level. And that's what we did. We scanned it all the way down carefully to where the nail was totally gone on the skin. And then it was fine. And as it grows out, it may or may not reattach, but we don't care. So yes, you can sand it off. You're absolutely right. I could not cut that off at this level. I could have cut it off when we realized that what was happening before. I'm getting frowns. What are you frowning? Is that both of you? Oh, no. No. <laughs> I was thinking, is it better to cut it in the shape? I mean, cut it straight, try to get it straight across and then use the sander? Or, I mean, to get it depends the on the nail. Thing. Every single nail in my whole career is different. different. Okay. There's, I can't tell you. Uh, I hear what you're saying, and sometimes that does work. Other times it's so, you've seen how these nails are. You're like, I don't know what's going to be best. You don't know what you're going to get into, how... how crumbly it's going to be when you get up further and this was already lifted off the skin the other way and so I can't make that kind of uh... look now looking at this see you know this it was longer we could have just cut it here straight across and then sanded it but we were learning to sand so she sanded it down so you can once you get more familiar with what you're seeing you can make those decisions and be prepared to rechange what you're doing okay another one before and after with, with cream on the skin. That was just catching on socks. And this was all done with the sander. There are people that I call them sanders, and actually in the class they're funny, they'll, they'll tell the nurse, I'm a sander, because their nails are so thick or so whatever that we can't cut them. We have to use the sander. So we use the sander to make it shorter, we use the sander to make it smaller, that's what that we use the sander for everything. And that was this case. She wasn't a regular for us. That's why those are so long. But uh, she was a sander. They, you can't put this. If I worked an hour at it, maybe. But boom, put the sander. Okay, this is a case. Before and after. This is a round old thing here. It was skin underneath. 
And I'm so proud, the nurse said, you see no blood. She was so careful. Thankfully, this was the end of the day <laughs> when she'd been doing them all day. Um, and that's what I mean too by going into the side. Sand this side again. And I would have done more here, but I was so happy with what she did. I didn't want to mess it up. Uh, I would have sanded this down a little bit more, this down a little bit more, but she stopped within a micron of where that skin was. She did an awesome job. Same with all of these. Now you can see little bits of blood, dry blood. That was not from her. That is dried blood from previous care or from trauma in the shoes. Mm -hmm. We don't see it here. So that was from trauma in the shoes, which again is why we have to do this. So that is awesome. She just did a great job. Nice. So someone, one, some, somebody was asking me, what do you do with these when they're curved over like that? Sometimes they're underneath and come up and touch. Sometimes they run into a callus on the distal edge. Sometimes they do this and hit the toe next door. Hmm. Doesn't matter, you do the same thing. You start wherever you can. I don't start at the definitive level because I don't know what's under there. I don't know if there's a pterygium, and I think we talked about that. I don't know if I'm gonna hit skin. I don't know what I'm gonna hit. So I will start here, somewhere out there where I can clearly see underneath and I know the skin isn't going to go that far. And I take my clipper, this is too big for a sander, I take the clipper and I little tiny bites and when you get to about there, the rest cracks off. And it, no, it does not crack back into the flesh. It cracks whatever direction your clipper was clipping. That's the lucky thing. Then once that pops off, which is three or four bites, little bites, not big ones makes a huge difference, and I'll talk about that. Um, then I can see under, I know what I'm getting after, and then I can decide, should I do this with the clipper another round? Should I do this with the sander? I can make more decisions, but I start out there somewhere. With these, same thing, you start about here, little teeny clips, one millimeter clips, halfway across it falls off. It fractures the rest of the way, is what I should say. And then, same thing for all these, these are so fast. Now this one's not. This one was totally round. Oh my goodness, that was tough. Luckily, we started right here and it was far enough that even though we were pinching it, couldn't not, she didn't feel it. It was We started far enough out and then we could sand the rest of the way. The thing that hurts them is if they have a rounded nail and you try to make it a flat nail. So here's a nail and you go in like this and lift this up to cut it. And I see podiatrists doing this. If the nail is like this, you have to move your hand take one millimeter bites all the way. Maybe you're going to take 10 bites to get across it. You don't go, ah. That lifts it up. It tears it up off its connection to the skin. It hurts. It causes trauma. Not necessary. Yes, it's faster, but you're a jerk. So, uh, so this is actually just as fast as anything else. This is about a year's growth, maybe 18 months. It's fine. That doesn't take any longer. Hi, I'm Dr. Julia Overstreet. I'm a podiatrist, and I'd like to take a little time today to talk to you about hyperkeratotic lesions on the foot. You may know them as corns and calluses. Most of us have them. Sometimes they're problems. They can even lead to ulcerations if the person is at high risk for that through diabetes, vascular insufficiency, that sort of thing. So let's take a look and see what we can do to keep our patients as healthy as possible. People ask me the difference between a corn and a callus. That's sort of a, a layman's term, but a callus is a more diffuse uh, presentation. It's across all of the ball of the foot or just portions of it, not and across the heel, that sort of thing. As opposed to corns, which are under, uh, excuse me, are associated with bony prominences, hammer toes, uh, like this one and this one. Or in this case, this is the plantar surface, the forefoot, there's the baby toe. So this might be a situation where this is under the fourth metatarsal head. And for some reason, that's lower than the rest of the metatarsal heads, getting more pressure, and it forms a corn. Hammer toes are one of the leading uh, musculoskeletal causes for corns, for those uh, uh, lesions, hyperkeratotic lesions that are related to bony prominences. A hammer toe is a contracted digit. It can be contracted at both joints, the proximal and distal interphalangeal. It can be contracted just there. It doesn't really matter. What matters is you can get three different lesions with a hammer toe. You can get one under that metatarsal head, as we saw in the last picture. 
We can get one at the top of the toe where it impacts the shoe, and that's the one we think about most often. But the one that we never think about is on the distal tip of the toe. You can see that as the shoe's pressing down here, that pushes down both here and here. Well, there at least is some padding under the ball of the foot, but you can see on the distal tip of the toe how close the bone is to the skin. So when you're walking on the tip of the toe as opposed to the pulpy part of the toe, it's very common to get distal tip lesions. So whenever you see contracted digits, you have to look at all three spots. Here in an exam, you may just look at this and see that this is a, a, obviously a lesion of some sort on top of these hammer toes. By the way, take a second to look at the skin on this person. The skin is thin, atrophic, it's hairless. The way this skin looks, you know that this person has arterial insufficiency. I don't mean you shouldn't do a full exam, but you know that you're dealing with an extremely high-risk person by looking at the foot. You need to be able to judge that in seconds to have a better idea of the treatment plan and, and the problems you're going to look for. But in the exam of this foot, you've got to move the foot in some way so that you can see underneath these toes to see if you have these lesions. And here's an example. Here's the before and after debridement. Look at that. That's a very serious situation, which in a very short period of time could have exposed bone there. The tip of the distal phalanx, as we saw in the last picture, is right there. So you have to look at those and take them very seriously. Here's a picture of the hammer toes up here. This doesn't have lesions yet, but I wanted to put this picture on to show you how flat the tips of the toes are. This skin isn't quite as thin and, and atrophic uh, as the pictures before, so this person has a little better arterial uh, flow, so a little bit better skin tone and turgor, but eventually they may develop corns and calluses and ulcerations also. So whenever you have hammer toes, you have to look at all three areas, underneath the ball of the foot, certainly on the tops of the toes, but underneath the toes as well. On the plantar surface of the foot, we have lesions that are associated with the metatarsal heads. So this would be the fifth, excuse me, the fourth metatarsal head. The fifth metatarsal head is way out here. This lesion is with, under the fifth metatarsal head. This lesion is under the fourth metatarsal head. And this lesion is probably under the second or third metatarsal head. It's hard to tell. It's easy to debride these either with a sander or with a scalpel. Uh, you need to debride them because something could be an ulceration uh, underneath the hyperkeratotic buildup and you need to know that so that you can treat it appropriately. In a situation like this, that needs to be probably sanded. That's a fairly flat callus and you could treat or trim that with a scalpel blade. We'll look at that later, don't worry. But that just needs to be sanded to see what's underneath it and to get some of that pressure off. In a situation like this where you can see something else is going on here, that's black underneath there. Is that dried blood? Is that an open lesion under there? It's hard to tell from this picture. But what you want to do, this is a pearl, please remember this. You want to warn your patient before you even start working on that. Warn them that there is a discoloration there and you're not sure if it's blood, maybe pus underneath there. If you warn them before you, you debride something and indeed there is blood or pus, they understand. But if they came in for routine toenail and callus care and suddenly they have blood and pus and they weren't warned, they think you created the situation. So please warn them when you see something at all unusual, not to scare them, but just say, you know, this is discolored and, and I'm, I'm a little concerned there might be some blood or pus under here. That's it. That's all you need to say and then go on with your debridement. What else are you going to do with these after you're done debriding? You're going to make sure that there's accommodation in their shoe for this or some sort of padding so that this doesn't continue to reoccur. And we'll look at some of those options later. The treatment for uh, hyperkeratotic lesions, regular debridement. Usually they can go about uh, 60 days, sometimes 90. It depends on a number of factors. Shoe changes and modifications, we're going to look at some of those. Aperture padding. Those are those felt Dr. Scholl pads you get at the drugstore. They can be excellent. We're going to look at that. And surgical correction of the underlying bony deformity. When it is a, a nucleated or a very distinct uh, hyperkeratotic lesion that's clearly the result of, say, a hammer toe, 
uh, or a bunion or anything like that, you can consider correction of the underlying uh, bony deformity to uh, affect a long-term modification and treatment of that. But not everyone is a surgical candidate, so we're not going to really discuss that there, discuss that here, other than to, to mention that that certainly is uh, part of the treatment protocol option. Sharp debridement. This is probably within your scope of practice as a nurse. You are not doing even wound debridement here. You're not going to be getting into any viable tissue if you do it properly. You're just taking hyperkeratotic tissue off the top of the, of the skin. That falls within most people's uh, scope of practice for nursing, but you definitely want to check your state regulations and your facility uh, regulations about this. But uh, sharp debridement is certainly the fastest way to take the pressure off. Whether we're sanding, by the way, or doing sharp debridement, we don't ever want to take all of the callus off. It's protected. We don't want to leave bare skin there. So leave a little tiny bit of, of your callus there uh, when you're finished. Here's an example of a nucleated lesion under probably the fourth metatarsal head. Looks kind of normal. You could even just sand this flat if you weren't comfortable with a scalpel. Uh, even getting this flat and with a sander would be a, a little bit of a help. But if you can take the scalpel, look what you can do. There's no blood here. There's no laceration. This is within your scope of practice, most likely. Please check. But what you've done is taken the deeper portion of this callus out. Not only is this going to be more comfortable if the patient has pain from it, but it's certainly less likely to cause any sort of ulceration from the pressure involved. Remember, they're walking on this. is the ball of the foot. So a big nugget of hyperkeratotic material like that pushes into the skin like that. And by the way, within about an hour after you do this, this doesn't look this deep anymore. That tissue has punched, uh, poofed back up a little bit. A lot of this is just from the pressure. And then there's an example of one of those Dr. Scholl type felt pads, and we'll look at those more later. The Dremel drill um, is the sanding tool that I use most. It's the quickest. It's easy to learn how to do. There are different types of uh, bits to use on it. This particular type is my favorite. We'll go over that more in another webcast. Um, in some institutions, you can't use this because of the dust that it creates. Realize that there is no literature anywhere at any time that documents pulmonary fungal infections as a result of inhaling toenail or fungal nail dust or, or the dust from doing the calluses. That is not a real problem, despite common mythology. Um, if you have asthma or anything like that, it is a particulate matter in the air, and that can certainly cause pulmonary inflammation and cause problems. I'm not saying it's without issue, but no one is going to get fungus in their lungs from nail debridement. And it's an excellent thing to do uh, to make your job faster, make it more effective and efficient. Once we have it debrided, either sharply or with the um, Dremel, we're going to want to pad that so that the patient is, number one, more comfortable, and number two, the callus doesn't come back uh, that quickly. A buttress pad, also known as a crest pad, relieves that distal tip pressure that we talked about. Here's a really flat distal tip here. It doesn't have a callus yet, but look how flat that is. So there's three different types. This is leather. This is a uh, silicone gel. This is a homemade one with a dental roll, you know that round dental uh, gauze that they use in cotton gauze in dental offices with um, a sling on it. The general idea of all of them is it has a sling of some sort that goes over one of the toes to hold it in place. It fits into the sulcus where there's plenty of room for it and it pushes those toes out just enough where you're no longer walking on this distal tip. Now you're walking more on the puffy part of the toe where you're intended to walk. I've never had secondary lesions from it. Uh, people tend to be very compliant with it because if they're not neuropathic, these distal tip pressure points hurt quite a bit. And they uh, appreciate the fact that with this, it doesn't hurt. So I have a great uh, following of patients who love these and wear them consistently. It also will prevent ulcerations. One question I get asked is, how long do they have to wear this? Well, any pad of any type that you use on the foot for this sort of thing does not correct the problem. 
Only surgery can correct the problem by, say in this case, straightening the toes. What the pads do is the same thing your eyeglasses do. Your eyeglasses don't correct your vision. It allows your eyes to operate better. Well, this allows your toes to sit more appropriately in your shoes or, or in stance and gait. So it does not correct anything. So they have to wear it the rest of their lives. Not at night in bed, but when they're up and, and walking in in their shoes, they have to wear it forevermore unless they do have surgery to correct the underlying bony deformity. The aperture pads generally available in most stores, uh, easy to come by. Make sure they're not medicated pads. We don't want that uh, acid on there. So these are just plain felt pads. And by the way, I, I like the felt pads over the foam rubber pads. The foam rubber pads are okay on dorsal lesions, say on the top of a hammer toe, but they on the planter surface just aren't thick enough to do any good. So these are the, the felt um, aperture pads. The one thing you want to know about aperture pad is the hole has to be big enough to go entirely around the lesion with a little room left over. So that's the advantage of something like this where it is an open uh, situation. If you get this kind, which is the more common kind, you either can cut them, make them larger if it's a larger sore, you can stretch them. This is just felt, so I grab it on each side and just tug it in felt, the felt and make this a bigger hole that way. It's especially true with these the, the size and shape for the hammer toes, these right here. You have to have this hole big enough to go over the entire knuckle, and if it isn't, you're going to create a problem. So just take a second and either stretch it, to be bigger or cut it to be bigger and put it over there. You can also secure it with a band-aid so that it stays on longer. They can even shower with these. I find that the toe, that the uh, adhesive padding, excuse me, the adhesive on the back of it protects the skin from the moisture. Sometimes we'll make them in the office that for specific reasons. Um, this is just one example of that. It might be in conjunction with wound care or something else, but you can take uh, quarter or half inch felt that's in a roll that we get uh, professionally and cut that into different shapes and do that sort of uh, accommodation with it. Other four foot uh, pads that you can buy at the store are things like this. You can get these silicone gel pads, has a toe loop so it would, the loop would go into, over one of the toes and that gel pad would be underneath to provide nice padding. This is a similar thing, it's the jello, excuse me, the silicone pad, but it's in a sleeve, sort of an elastic sleeve that fits over the, the big toe and stays in place that way. This one's an interesting one. I like this quite a bit because it has a number of different uses. Not only does it have a nice pad underneath that can be uh, effective in padding plantar forefoot lesions, but it also can hold down hammer toes. That's why it comes in one, two, or three loop varieties, because if you're trying to hold down one hammer toe, one loop, two hammer toes, two loops, very seldom do I use the third loop, but this will be a common thing. So if the hammer toes are still flexible, if they haven't frozen in that contracted position, you can use this sort of uh, device to hold them down during gait. That eliminates all three of the possible pressure points from a hammer toe deformity. Uh, so I really do like those. They're washable, they use them for a long time, so they're not very cost, uh, they're, they're not a problem cost-wise, um, and I've not seen any secondary lesions from them. So these are good planter forefoot, or in the one case, also a hammer toe pad. Pressure relief pads within the shoe, nice soft thing, or you can have some uh, professionally made where maybe the lesion is accommodated with a uh, professional cut out in the orthotic, these kind of things. By the way, realize that if they're using something like this, they have to take out the accommodative, excuse me, the insole that's in the shoe. You don't put this on top of the manufacturer's insert. You take the manufacturer's insert out of their existing shoe and put these in in place of it. Extra depth shoes. These are generally available now. Uh, you used to have to make them uh, from scratch. It was extremely expensive, but these are all over the counter now, and you see that they are, in fact, extra depth. They accommodate inserts. They accommodate hammer toes. Some of them aren't bad looking. Um, in reality, a nice tennis shoe is an extra depth shoe, and you can remove its insole and put a better insole in it. So they don't need these type for all uh, of our patients, but these are certainly much more available now than they used to be. 
a way that they can modify their existing shoe gear. We've all looked at at shoes and seen these spots where we can tell they have hammer toes because they have uh, punched out the corresponding area of their leather shoes. And we don't want our feet to be the ones doing that. We want the shoe repairman to do that. So in a situation like this, the lesion is caused by it not being a high enough toe box and pre the toe being used to push through and stretch the leather. Let's educate our patients to do it a different way. When they have spots that maybe are hammer toes, bunions, where there are uh, pressure points, have them, when they get new shoes, put the shoe on and stand up in it so that your foot kind of settles down into it. And then you can feel where those spots are. You mark them with some masking tape. Then you take your foot out, obviously. You take these shoes to the shoe repairman. You let the shoe repairman put them on this nice fancy machine and stretch those spots out. We don't want our feet to stretch the shoes out. For $5, the shoe man can do that for you, and the shoes are immediately comfortable and safe to wear. By the way, these sort of things that we're all used to seeing, they don't work, so don't even try that. Mark the shoe, take them to the shoe repairman. That's a great patient education piece. More patient education. Uh, I like these black sanding paddles. Patients can use those fairly safely. You can also just get the same kind of grit sandpaper. Um, they sell them generally at most stores these days for acrylic uh, fingernails. Well, you can use the same thing for sanding heels, sanding some calluses gently. Before you recommend this, make sure that the skin is thick enough and, and well nourished enough that the patient isn't going to hurt themselves with it. So that's a judgment call on your part. But this is a safe kind of thing for them to do in between visits. What I don't want them to do is, oh, I don't know, use a razor blade. This is something that's sold commonly. And as far as this, a uh, pumice stone, your callus is more dense than the pumice stone. You typically have more pieces of pumice fall off than callus. So this really doesn't do any good at all. So they're kind of wasting their time. I'd rather they get something like this. This petting is a good thing. Um, by the way, how do I know it's a good thing? What I did and what you need to do when you're considering recommending something or when you're being asked by your patients, gee, can I use something like that? Go and buy one. You have to check it out for yourself. So I bought one. I used it on myself. I used it on my hand where the skin is thinner, uh, like it might be more with my patients. It's fairly safe to use. They can hurt themselves with it, but it's not a cheese grater sort of, of situation. It really is fairly gentle. So you need to make the judgment call whether it is for a specific patient. But for most patients, I like the pet egg and the other versions of it that are now available. I think it's pretty effective to use in between um, visits. What I don't ever want them to use is the Dr. Scholl corn remover pet, uh, liquids. This is acid. And it's an acid that is not specific to hyperkeratotic tissue. It will eat anything that it's on. That's a tragedy, especially on the tops of toes where the skin is thinner. A number of times in my career, I have taken these things off to find I'm looking at tendon or I'm looking at bone. It is eaten all the way through the thinner skin on the dorsum of the toes. The skin on the plantar surface is a little bit thicker and you don't have quite as many problems, but it's not safe to use. And it does not remove the coronary callus the way the name implies. It simply softens it. So it does make it more comfortable, but in the long run, you haven't solved any problems other than uh, it becoming a little more comfortable in the short run. And because it is more comfortable, people leave it on longer than they should. They will leave it on for days, and that's when the tragedies happen. So I have a poster of this in my office. They are not to ever use this product. And if they come into me with these little white spots on their skin, even though they've removed the pad, they're busted. They are in such trouble with me because I don't want them using this ever. It's dangerous. So wherever calluses are or corns on the person's foot, you kind of have a better idea what to do about it now. It can be sanded. It can be uh, sharply debrided with a uh, scalpel. Both of those should be within your nursing scope of practice, but do check your facility and your state. We know a little bit more about padding them with over-the-counter pads. 
uh, shoe inserts. We know about how to modify shoes a little bit better. And patient education as far as pressure reduction, shoe choices, that sort of thing. Hello, I'm Dr Berry. Hi. Do you mind if I examine your feet today? No, that's fine. Good. You don't have any pain in your feet at the moment, do you? No. Good. Can I get you to stand up for me? Okay, I'm just going to have a look at your feet. Can I get you to just take a step forwards? Okay, and if I get you to just lie on the bed now for me. Just have a look at your foot footwear. I'm just going to have a closer look at your feet. Okay. Feel your pulse on the inside. Okay, so I'm just going to test for your sensation in your feet now. So I'm just going to use this. It looks quite sharp, but it's actually very gentle. Just feel it there. Okay, we get you to close your eyes. I want you to say yes when you can feel that um, poking in your feet. Can you feel that? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay, brilliant. I'm just going to do the other side now, so keep closing your eyes. Yes. 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 No. Okay. No worries. Yes. 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 Okay, that's brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and following from the examination, there's quite a few questions I'd like to ask the patient. In particular, do they have any problems with pain um, or sensation changes in their feet? I'd like to know how well they look after their feet. Do they check their feet daily? Have they had their up-to-date annual screening recently? Um, and do they ever walk around barefoot? I'd also like to talk a little bit more about how their diabetes is controlled and whether that's up to date at the moment. Go. Hello, my name is Debbie King and I'm a certified fitter of compression garments at Brownfields in Idaho. This is my co-worker, Lisa Malispin. She's also a certified fitter of compression garments. In today's video, we are going to show you how to apply a compression stocking at home without our professional assistance. So I'm going to narrate while Lisa dons the garment. So here's her stocking that she's going to be applying. First of all, she's going to go palm up, down the back of the garment to the heel. She's then tucking the heel under her thumb like a puppet. You're holding on to it and now go back up to the top of the stocking and turn it inside out down to where your thumb is located. Now flip the stocking over and remove your fingers and you'll see now you have a nice toe tunnel and this is your starting point. We know the heel pocket is going on the bottom of your foot. So now Lisa will begin the application process by bringing her leg up over her knee. She'll open that toe tunnel up with her hands 
and bring it halfway up her foot, keeping it nice and flat. Now she's going to reach down to the top band and scoop the rest of the garment over her toes and heel. At this point, the stocking gets rather difficult to pull, so this is where you'll want to apply your rubber gloves with texture. Now that Lisa has her gloves on, she's ready to proceed. So she's going to go back down just above her heel and tug. As she's tugging, the stocking will eventually gather and she will smooth the garment out, working it up her leg. We'll continue the tugging and smoothing until the heel pops into place. She'll continue bringing it. She's actually making it fit her toes first, which is great. Now we're going to continue the tugging and flattening process up to just below the knee. She's pretty close now, so she'll probably go ahead and remove her gloves. She'll go back to the top band and position that band two fingers below the knee. This is very important not to over pull your garment. We only want it two fingers below the knee because we don't want it to collapse from the bend of the knee area. It needs to lay flat. Okay, so she now has it positioned. She's checking her garment now for wrinkles. And as we see, she needs to use her gloves again to smooth those out. We always want the garment to lay flat against the skin. She will now apply the gloves and simply pat gently in a whisking motion to disperse that extra fabric to get a flat garment on her leg. She's doing a few readjustments until it feels comfortable on the foot. The stocking's now applied and you're ready, you're ready to wear it for the rest of the day. So thank you for watching our video today. We, all, we would like to show you now the process of taking the garment off. Let's say you've had it on all day. You'll simply bring your foot up over your leg again, start at the top of the stocking, a gentle, gent, gentle downward motion over the heel, support your leg and pop the stocking off the end of your foot. It will be long and inside out at this point. You always want to avoid wadding or you'll get stuck. So long and inside out is your goal. Reasons not to soak. This is like a bad comedy routine, right? Reasons not to soak. Cross-contamination. You cannot effectively clean the bucket in between. Most surface cleaners say they need between 45 seconds and three minutes of wet surface contact. Hold on. People get upset at this point. Of wet surface contact. It doesn't stay on that long, does it? It doesn't stay wet. You can't clean it. You can use a disposable garbage bag that you change with each person and document. It's not only in your guidelines, but in each chart note that you have used a new uh, bar, uh, liner in the bucket to soak your feet. Otherwise, you have no, if they get any kind of infection, that's the first question they're going to ask you, and you have no defense to them getting an infection. Even if you cleaned your instruments appropriately, if you soak their feet, so just hold on to your thoughts for a second, we can see. So you can use a new liner bed with every patient and document it in the chart, not just in your protocols. Mm -hmm. uh, and the guidelines for disinfection sterilization. An important issue regarding the use of Disinfections for non-critical surfaces in healthcare settings is that the contact time specified on the label of the product is often too long to be practically followed. Which is what we just said. The labels of most products registered by the EPA for use specify a contact time of 10 minutes of wet surface contact. Such a long contact time is not practical for disinfection in environmental surfaces in a healthcare setting because most healthcare facilities apply disinfectant and allow it to dry in less than a minute. And if you're cleaning a bucket, that's what's happening. You cannot justify that. We don't want the patients to think that soaking is a good idea. It's bad modeling. 
We don't know at home, we've discussed this, what they're soaking in, if the water's too hot, if the dog drank out of that at the last picnic, we don't know. It dries the skin. We don't want to model that behavior for them. Well, the nurse does it, so that must be good. Is their basin or bucket clean or did the dog drink out of it? Did they fill it with water that was too hot, particularly a problem with neuropathy? Can cause burns, we've all seen it, many of us have seen it. Soaking is very drying to the skin and they can be using inappropriate soaking agents. Although soaking of the feet has been a traditional approach to treatment, it is of no benefit. In fact, it can lead to maceration and worsening infection. Because the foot is insensitive, soaking may take place in water that is too hot, resulting in severe burns, not what we're talking about at home. Chemical soaks can result in chemical burns. It makes tissue planes harder to differentiate, making sanding or cutting with a scalpel harder. When I'm trying to cut a callus down and the tissue is wet, I can't tell when I'm through callus to good skin. Even if the foot hasn't been soaked, I have to cut a little bit off or sand it, whichever you're doing, and go do something else on the foot for a few minutes while this hardens up again. Once the part you've just exposed, you've taken a layer of the callus off, then the part under that was soft, uh, in just a few minutes as you're trimming other things, will harden back up. And then you can reach over there, oh no, there's a lot more here. Trim off a little bit more, then go and do something else on the foot for a minute. And it take me several times going back and forth sometimes, especially after using a scalpel, but even with a sander, to make sure I don't go too deep. I want to stop just before normal skin. If this is a callus that's over a bony prominence, you want to leave some of the callus on for protection. I can't tell where that spot is if the skin has been soaked. I can't tell with a scalpel or a blade, so it makes it difficult for me to do my job properly. Whether sanding or using a scalpel, we need to be able to determine the harder callus material from the softer skin. If the skin has been soaked, this can be very difficult. It could result in less effective debridement or cutting too deeply. I don't have 20 minutes. I'm trying to see people. A lot of folks out there need me. I have 20 minutes. Whether it's at a clinic schedule or you're working on your own, you only have a certain amount of time for each patient. It's seldom possible to add an extra 15 minutes or so uh, to add a regimen of soaking. You have to clean the bucket, you have to sit them down, you have to put them in there, and then wait, even if it's only five minutes, then it's another five minutes to clean them off and dry them. I don't have that kind of time. So even if I could do my job properly, and even if it wasn't a cross-contamination risk, I don't have time. Cross-contamination, <laughs> bad modeling, tissue planes harder to differentiate, don't have 20 minutes extra. Having said that, washing is different than soaking. <coughs> Many feet need to be washed. Washing is different than soaking. Washing can take five minutes. I get that. But you're not putting them in a bucket of water. The bucket's usually on the floor. I do this with my homeless people. The bucket's on the floor. I'm cleaning them up with Fiza Derm or whatever. Uh, whatever. I don't care what it is. Whatever it is we can really use. And it's dropping into the bucket. And then we take tap water in the saline bottle and we you know, rinse it off. And in the meantime, we clean between the toes. I call it toe flossing. And we clean it up. Now cleaning, washing is different than soaking. It doesn't get the skin so wet that I can't do my job, and I can't tell tissue planes, and I can't use my drill. It doesn't take 20 minutes. I don't have to worry about cross-contamination because I'm not putting their foot in anything. Their foot is suspended. I'm cleaning it with a towel or whatever, and so, and rinsing it off with water. That's washing. Washing is appropriate. Hold on to your thoughts. <laughs> Okay, how do you convert patients? Because most patients, as well as some nurses, are used to soaking. Well, what are you going to do? What do you mean you're not going to soak my feet? These are wonderful seniors who don't get touched, who don't get pampered, who don't get that kind of consideration. First of all, I tell them about the infection risk. I say, you know, I know you're used to that, and I know you've not had a problem. But as a healthcare professional, I have to tell you that I worry about germs in the water, that maybe the bucket wasn't clean properly. And I don't want to expose you to that. I say, I actually wouldn't put my foot in a bucket that someone else had had their feet in. Well, I just see that and I'm like, whoa, never thought of that. 
Even if they bring their own bucket, I don't know where that's been. I don't know if the dog drank out of it the last picnic and now they're bringing it in. So even if they bring their own bucket, tell them about drying effect on the skin. It's not healthy. I've already talked to them about what soap they're using and that, that I want them to use Dove. Tell them you're concerned about their health. Tell them that you do intend to pamper them. You're going to give them a wonderful foot massage at the end of the treatment. They'll love it. Those of you who have been to our class, what do they say as we're doing the massage at the end? Oh, I've been waiting for this. Mm -hmm. Almost every one of them. Mm -hmm. It takes exactly one time to convert them. And we might spend 30 seconds or a minute giving them a wonderful foot massage, and that's actually a long time. But it's 30 seconds or a minute, and I have no cross contamination. I'm modeling something I want them to do, which is moisturize, and I'm out of there. And they feel pampered. So you want to exchange something that you don't want them to do anyway, that could give them an infection, that could leave you legally liable for causing an infection, that models bad behavior and will dry their skin, that makes it difficult for you to provide thorough debridement. You want to exchange that for something that will relax them, model good habits, and keep both you and them safe from getting or causing an infection. Okay, cross-contamination. We have to be very aware of that, so we're going to go over some of that. Number one, procedures, protocols, documentation. Hugely important, whether you're in clinic or not. We talked about this this morning, so we won't go over it a lot now. Most of these forms are on my website. Make up your own. You have to have guidelines, protocols, procedures. I'm happy to provide them, take these, and change them. Google them. You can Google this stuff now. Google all of this, and you'll get your own examples of it. But you have to have these things. Not all of them. Some are just things that will help you. Uh, free downloadable on either of the sites uh, to get some of those forms for free. And if you see one that you didn't, if you don't, if you saw one there that you don't see on the site, just email me and I'll email it to you. I don't have all of them up there. Okay. How do we clean these instruments? Disinfection and Sterilization Guideline Recommendation for Podiatric Physicians. This is in the CDC and their directives in 2008. Their recommendations based on the CDC, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As with wound care uh, instruments, foot care instruments do not need to be sterilized. They need to be disinfected. In Canada, they have to be sterilized. Different governing bodies. Those nurses have to buy autoclaves. All of them do not need to be sterilized. So what the CDC says, and this should be, and you can download this from them or from my site, put it in your guideline booklet because it validates what you're doing. And what they say is, this is the CDC language, virtually no document, excuse me, no virtual risk, excuse me, virtually no risk has been documented for transmission of infectious agents to patients through non-critical items, this is only the government can say it like this, when they're used as non-critical items. Uh, items that do not <laughs> contact non-intact skin or subcutaneous <laughs> tissue. That is your government at work. Basically what it says is if you don't touch blood, it's not a colonoscopy. This is non-critical. A critical instrument is something that touches deeper structures where infection can pass. That's a colonoscopy. That's a surgery. This is not even you know, a, a, a port. It's nothing. So as long as you don't touch blood, which, you know, you scratch on something, it's a non-critical instrument, and you can wipe it off with a surface wipe and go on. However, they're quick to say they don't recommend that. They want you to treat it as, uh, as, med as moderate, medium level, it's an intermediate level disinfection. And they give example, include nail cutting instrument, nail burrs, scalpel handles used for dividement of hyperkeratonic tissue. So we are validated in not having to sterilize our instruments for foot care, but we have to disinfect them. Intermediate level disinfection, destroy all vegetative bacteria, including tuberculi, lipids, some non-lipid viruses, fungi, etc. I had someone recently who was sure that as long, oh, it's my last hands on class who was sure that as long as it was antifungal, it was good. And I said, we're not worried about transmission of fungus at all. 
we're worried about transmission of bacteria and viruses. Um, and TB and things like that, but anyway. Guidelines for disinfection, and this is uh, a condensed version of that that you can look up. That's not the CDC's website, but it's uh, lower extremity infections, leinfections.com. Types of disinfection, and this is back to the CDC. Chlorine and chlorine compounds, formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, which is what Cytex is. That's what most of us use for cold sterilization of glutaraldehyde. Not hydrogen peroxide from a bottle. This is industrial strength hydrogen peroxide and other pro uh, products there. Users should read labels carefully to ensure the correct product is selected for the intended use. I have a lot of clinics I go to where they're using surface cleaner to disinfect instruments. It doesn't work like that. You have to get instrument disinfectant products. You've got to read, and it was right there on the label. There are instrument sprays, there are uh, enzyme pre-soaks, there's a lot of other things, instrument milk, where it is something that stops it from kind of corroding, which even stainless steel can do. So there are other products to take care of instruments. These are kind of up to you. The basic thing that we have to do is the cold sterilization for whatever period of time that particular product calls for. Uh, cleaning is the removal of foreign material from the object. So you have to take a toothbrush, dedicated, or an instrument brush, dedicated. Oh, you so have to say these things. <laughs> you so, you so, I, oh. Really? Um, to get the garbage out, the toenail debris, the, the, the little bit of, uh, of dry blood if you get something, the whatever, especially your curette. We'll talk about that in a minute. What, but you, so you have to get the garbage off of it first before you clean it because none of these cleaners are meant to do that. They're meant to s disinfect clean instruments. Oh, there you go. No more Cytex. Uh, you can do it in a, in a tray, a dip tray like that. You can do it in a Tupperware thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be metal. It can be plastic. It can be glass. It can be anything for these cold sterilization fluids. If you're on your own, I would do it in what's called a lock and lock, which is four locks, uh, Tupperware-ish thing that has a silicone rim. And that way it doesn't spill. If you're in clinic, of course, it's not a problem. You have a tray or something. Uh, you can use bleach. Cheap, good, hard on your instruments. And the dilution is, what is it? What does it say? Yeah, I think it's one to 100. It's like a tablespoon. It's not a lot. Uh, but it's hard on your instruments. So you can definitely use that. It's cheaper, but your instruments won't last as long. It's corrosive. But you can use it technically. The instrument pouches, this is a, a, a Julia thing. These are meant, of course, for autoclaving. They're self steel bags. We put cleaned instruments, the garbage off, in and put them in an autoclave. And then the little bar turns color when it's been steam sterilized. But what I was finding was I have a big bucket of instruments, whether I'm at my class or I'm going to a facility, and nobody on me knew they were clean. And so I got this idea to get those same things. I would do my cold sterilization steps, air dry them, and I package them. That way, and I'm not trying to imply they're sterile. I'm not going to put them up with other instruments where they can be misinterpreted as sterile. These are just my instruments. But that way, the patient's family, the patient, the director of nursing for the floor understands or has some confidence that I have appropriately disinfected these. So this is totally my idea, and use it or don't. If you just have two sets of instruments, great. They will see you swap them out into the cleaning solution out, and vice versa. But if I have multiple sets, and I don't have time to do that, I'm trying to get through an entire floor. So I do this, and then I go back the next day, and. I disinfect them appropriately again, air dry them, and repackage them. Just a thought, if you have multiple instruments and you want people to understand that they're clean, appropriately disinfected, you do not have to do this, let me be clear. And where do you get those? You can get them on any site, more medical, you can get them on my site, any place that sells surgical, anything. And it's called? They're just called uh, self-seal sterilization pouches. And any, there's lots of sizes. I like this size because it's three and a half by nine and it is most useful. Comes in lots of sizes. They're fairly cheap. Oh, yeah. Sharpening lubrication. I don't find you have to sharpen these instruments. Now in Canada, they sharpen instruments. 
They have whole businesses that sharpen your instruments. I've done this for a very long time. I've never had to sharpen anything. Eventually, the mechanism kind of wears out and you throw it away. Because you can't really fix that, which is the lubrication part. Um, I've never, if you use them properly, and I'm not saying the Canadians don't, they just have a different system, um, you don't need to sharpen these. You're not using them that way. These aren't scalpels. Um, lubrication milk is nice. I don't. I've never used it, but it's a good thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it keeps your instruments fresh longer. Not, by fresh, I mean functional a little bit longer. I was just always too lazy. But instrument milk, it's called, is a good thing. It's it's before. I think it's after. It's after every cleaning. It takes some of the types of stainless steel surgical instruments, and it does. I just never did it, but absolutely, it's a good thing. So, foot care instruments that are used on feet with no infection and no bleeding, you can use a 1 to 10 bleach solution. Absolutely you can, according to CBC, intermediate level disinfection. Foot care instruments that are used on feet where bleeding or a laceration has occurred need to be cleaned with glutaraldehyde, some kind of cold disinfection for 20 minutes or whatever that product says. Some are 10, some are 30. You have to know what your product requires as far as the time of immersion. That's high level disinfection. Uh, to me, that's still intermediate. This is wrong, I have to change that. This is still intermediate. These are wrong, okay. High level would be gas sterilizers or uh, autoclave. So this is not, I apologize, that slide is wrong. Okay, let's talk about dust. Ooh. The dreaded toenail dust. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. What are the real issues here? Exposure to nail dust was first discussed and described in the literature as an occupational hazard in the, in the early 70s. In 1975, two female chiropodists, which I think we were called that then, but anyway, were diagnosed with allergic hypersensitivity. Sensitivity. Two out of thousands. Okay. Biological dust from the hand and foot care procedures may deposit in the conjunctiva and nose throughout the respiratory tract. The local irritation of these areas can lead to conjunctivitis, itching, tearing, rhinitis, sneezing, asthmatic attacks, bronchitis, and coughing. That is true. It is absolutely true. Uh, me in a room with five nurses teaching this, I come over with a real, hex, real sexy voice because it just does that to you. That part is true. <laughs> Exposure to so it's a particulate problem. Exposure to nail dust and the associated risk will vary with and these are, this is all in literature, the policies and practices in place, the type of podiatry drill used, therapy technique, frequency of procedures, personal protective equipment utilized, use of ventilation systems. While the large particles settle out to the floor, varying amounts of smaller particles remain suspended and inhaled or impacted on the practitioner and the clinical environment. Did that make sense? They, they state things really. The particle sizes range from whatever. The reason it ranges is whatever the size of your burr, whether it's diamond or sand, whatever, that's what size the particles are. Mm -hmm. For those of you who have been in my, in my hands-on class, we practice with balsa wood. The particles of balsa wood that come up is the same size as the particles of nail come up because it's dependent on the size, the grit of the sand that you're using. Oops, did I miss the part? The, oh, it ranges in size. Nail dust collected during foot care procedures performed in office settings has been found to contain keratin, debris, not bugs, debris, uh, viable fungal elements including dermatophytes, trichophyte and rubrum, and saprophytes. Now, only within the last decades has a definite link, definitive link between sensitization and trichophyton and asthma been seen. If you have asthma, if you have bronchitis, this is probably not the career for you. In this article down here, uh, 2005, evidence is presented to support an etiologic role for trichophyton infections in the development of asthma and other allergic diseases. Absolutely. If you're prone to those things, you should not be doing this. End of story. It is widely known and accepted, I'm sorry I'm reading you this, but it's important to get it right, uh, accepted that fungi can induce asthma, but it is estimated that only 10% of the population has allergic antibodies to fungal elements and only 5% would be symptomatic, which is still a lot. Local irritation of these areas can lead to conjunctivitis, asthma, whatever. The literature suggests that nail dust can be a respiratory sensitizer 
which is defined as a substance that when breathed then can trigger an allergic reaction in the respiratory system. What is not mentioned in the literature? Lung infections with dermatophytes, which is what we have, that's what trichophyton is, all of those foot fungus are dermatophytes, is not mentioned anywhere in the literature. Why? Lung infections with trichophyton, with dermatophytes, is not mentioned. Why not? Dermatophytes eat keratin. That's why they're on skin and nails. Lots of keratin. Keratin is a major component of skin and nails. There is no keratin in the lungs. Do you get fungal elements in the lungs? Yes, you do. Can it grow there? No, it cannot. It can create eosinophilia, which means you can become allergic to it. It can sensitize you. If you have bronchitis and asthma, it can set off an attack. If you do it enough and you have that predisposition, you can develop asthma. All true. What you cannot develop is a pulmonary dermatophyte infection. There is no such thing. It rides the, uh, the keratin, excuse me, the, the nail, which is keratin. The, the fungus elements will ride the keratin particles into your lungs, absolutely. The villa do their thing and get it out in the next day or two. You cannot get an infection in your lungs from dermatophytes. However, oh, this is, sorry, what you can get in your lungs is toilet flushing infections. It's been shown over and over, it was even on 60 minutes about six or seven years ago. Toilet flushing aerosolizes bacteria, fungus, and viruses that grow where? In dark, warm places, like your lungs. So all of you who are working in environments with the self-flush toilets, that is an environment, with no lid, that's an environmental hazard. Do a, not only a Medline search, do a Google search. They have plated toothbrushes. We're just sitting there, plated, it's a gas. They just grow everything on your toothbrush if it's within 10 feet of your toilet. That's a lung risk. Because what? Those things grow in the lungs. <coughs> um, this is another study though. Many individuals may be unaware of the risk of airborne dissemination of microbes and flushing the toilet and the consequent surface contamination that may spread infection within the household via direct surface to hand to mouth contamination. Some enteric viruses could persist in the air after toilet flushing and infection may be acquired after inhalation and swallowing. You can get a lung infection from flushing your toilet, which we don't do, but you can, you can't get it from nails. Other microbes certainly do grow in the lungs, however. So this is my final caveat because I'm not unaware of risk. These things definitely grow in your lungs. These things can be aerosolized with the toenail dust. If these things follow the toenail dust into your lungs, you will get bad infections. Absolutely. What do I do with this, in, this reality? When I'm in a facility, uh, 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 I, the only one I still do is a respiratory care. They're weaning them off fence and things. There's C. diff, there's MRSA. These people are sick. I don't take my dermal. I don't even take it. I had the uh, C. diff, it was worse than chemo. I'm not getting it. And C. diff travels. MRSA doesn't, if it's not right there where you're working, it's, it's okay. Fine. C. diff travels in the air. And I take those black emery boards. That's all they get. And I'm sorry. So I'm not saying there's no risk. I'm saying you have to know where there is risk. If you're in a facility or a place or in a person's home where there is disease that can grow in your lungs, don't dremel, sand, whatever you're doing. Don't do it. You can get a horrible lung infection. But I did routine work through my chemo, never got sick. I even had them at one point, it, I did, wasn't lung cancer, but they were trying to figure out what something was down there. And they were gonna do a biopsy thing. And as I'm going out with the wonderful drugs they gave me, I said, um, would you take a, a fungal culture down there? They said, why? They're not doing that, but in my hospital they know, don't, just do what she says, because I'm going to be nosy if not. So whatever, they took the culture, there was nothing growing there, and I was well into immunocompromised with chemo. And I was doing this work all the time. Nothing was growing. Because keratin, was there keratin in there? Yes. It was all dead. It can't grow there. 
but I'm the first one not to use it in any place that's going to get me that. Does that all make sense? Okay, so all this fuss about nail, you can Google or Medline, pulmonary infections from toenail dust, you will find zero. You will find those things that I showed you about sensitivity reactions and two doctors that had eosinophilic reactions. That's it throughout history. If you Google, just do it for fun. To uh, pulmonary infections from toilet flushing, hundreds of thousands of reports. That's, yeah, that's the reality. Lots of bugs, some I don't want in my lungs, in my lungs. Dermatophytes, uh, it's all right. So I don't use a Dremel and a or any other power sander when there's anything there in the patient, in the room, in their house, in the facility that could give me something I don't want. So I don't mean to minimize the risk, I mean to be realistic about when it's a risk and when it's just nasty. None of us like that stuff in our lungs. Which you probably not. can figure is in any like nursing home. No, they, they, they'll, they'll be, I mean, you could, that would be safest. In the one where I go, they have it posted. You know, C. Diff here today. <laughs> so, but you're right, you can't rely on that, so you may choose to do that. Uh, C. Diff is still, it's anywhere in the facility if it's somewhere. Okay, so you can get devices that suck the air up. This is one I had, it's called a Sani Vac. It's a, basically a vacuum cleaner with a gooseneck that you're supposed to sit next to you and put the gooseneck next to the foot. It is about a thousand decibels. It's a vacuum cleaner. I bought them for every one of my treatment rooms. I never used them. I was going to do long-term ear, hearing damage to myself, and I couldn't hear the patients talk. And that's the fun of doing this work. You get to talk to your patients. I never used them. Finally sold them. This is a great machine. It sucks up the dust. It's great. It's fairly quiet. There are a lot of them on the market. The problem is they're expensive. They run between $900 and about $2,000. Um, and you need to have a backup because Whoever you bought it from, I only carry them on my side because there's no backup when they break, and I don't want people to be mad at me. So buy them somewhere else because uh, I nobody will fix them. They're all from Germany and England. It was German. Comparison of the effectiveness of nail dust extractors. So this was a thing done. Are those even effective if you use them? This was a study. Electrical debridement of nails results in hazards, whatever, toxic uh, airborne particles. This study compared it. All extractors were more effective than the control, with a minimum of 24.6% effectiveness and a maximum of 91. And you can, of course, find out with yours in the literature what yours is. So they range in effectiveness of taking, what they mean by effectiveness is taking the bugs out of the air from 24% to 91%. So if it's 91% effective, that's great. If it's 24, obviously, that's not a lot of help. So if you're going to invest in that, do your best to get that number, which is going to be a real effort. Uh, even with the most effective dust extractors, the electric nail debridement process is not totally risk-free because of the uh, extractor's range of 25 to 92% effective in reducing airborne particles was the bottom line to that report. You have your N95 respirators. Um, it's the difference between normal, by respirators they mean masks, uh, normal mask and the N95, and I want to mention that. Most N95 masks are manufactured for use in construction and industry that expose you to dust and small particles. Um, N95 masks, cleared by the FDA for use in healthcare settings, are surgical N95 respirators. These devices meet some of the same performance standards as a surgical face mask and are also NOISH, which is a environmental hazard thing, certified to meet the N95 respirator performance, which all that means is it's better. And N95 is better, they come in different forms. That bill, he did, well, did. It takes up more. Excuse me. It filters smaller particles out, is what I should say. Uh, a, a regular mask, let's see. A regular surgical mask, not designed for use as a particulate respirator. It's designed for you not to spit on a surgical field. You have to turn it around and put it on backwards to prevent that from coming to you. Now, it works both ways, but overall, it's the other way around. Um, do not provide, so regular masks don't provide as much protection from microparticles, the size of the particle is what it does differently. Surgical masks provide barrier protection against droplets, um, and they're, used, they're uh, good for filtering some small particles, but the N95 keeps out smaller particles. 
So if you want to go to that, you absolutely can. Conclusion. Very low risk of fungal and lung infections with the Dremel, with any sanding of the nails. Positive risk for lung infections from microbes such as MRSA and C. diff. No mechanical sanding in those settings is my recommendation. Personal protective equipment in 95 masks are better than plain surgical masks, but both are useful. Dust extractors can be effective, but not perfect, and depends on the brand. Hi, I'm Dr. Julia Overstreet. I'm a podiatrist, and I'd like to take some time today to talk to you about mycotic and dystrophic toenail care. As our seniors increase in numbers, um, this is going to be an, a very important part of the duties of all healthcare practitioners who are willing to do it. I know it's not the glamour business, but you can prevent infections and even ulcerations if this care is done properly and regularly. So let's get started. These are your basics. Um, two different sizes of clippers, a curette, and a Dremel. And we'll go over each of these in detail a little bit later, but that's the basics that you need to do professional care. The clippers, there's double action, the two sets of, of hinges here, and the single action, which is of course the more common. The double action clippers give you more ergonomic ability to cut through the thicker nails, although I have to say you're only going to be using the distal two or three millimeters of the blades. You don't put the entire thing, uh, nail into here and clip down. But even when you're just doing the, uh, the distal couple of uh, millimeters of the nail, it helps to have that mechanical advantage in some of these nails. So double action clipper, single action clipper. These are not the kind of clippers that we use professionally when we're doing nails. That's fine if that's what your patients are using at home, but that's not what I mean when I'm talking about toenail clippers. The curette. Uh, there are hundreds of types of dermal curettes. What I like is a double-ended uh, 2.5 millimeter and 3 millimeter uh, uh, curette. A curette, if you're not familiar with it, is sort of like a scoop or a melon baller. It has a smooth side on the bottom part of the cup and the top ridge of the cupped area is a sharp edge. You know, not sharp like a scalpel, but sharp enough to kind of be able to um, soft or to get some extra debris out and even nail debris if you use it properly. We don't use orange sticks, those, those little orange, uh, they're not orange, those little uh, wooden sticks that pedicurists use. We use surgical instruments and we learn how to use them properly. It's inappropriate to use an orange stick. It doesn't do what we need it to do. It's not um, disinfectable at the end. And we need to use the appropriate equipment to get the best job done for our patients. So you can see here, we're, uh, the scooped edge, the rounded edge is up against the skin. And here the instrument's the other direction, although you can't really tell in this picture, and the scoop, the rounded end, is down towards the skin. You always have that more cutting edge toward the nail. You might use it in a case like this to clear out some of this debris and loosen up the edge of this difficult nail so that you can clip it better. You're not digging with the curette. You're not doing any damage, drawing blood. It's an instrument that with any scope of practice you can use if you use it properly. When the patients cut their nails, they cut them straight across and we want them to do that. For a patient to cut their own nails, that's the safest way to do it. We're professionals. What we want to do is cut rounded. We want to bevel down these edges. There is an appropriate way to do that. We're going to go over uh, how that is done, but it makes it a lot safer. Number one, as that nail grows out, you don't have those edges up here that are sharp, squared off points that cut into the adjacent nail or the other leg when they're um, moving around in bed at night, so you have it nice and rounded there. Number two, if it's done properly, which I'm going to teach you, you don't leave a little spike of nail out here that can grow out in the next couple of weeks and make an ingrown toenail. The number one cause of ingrown toenails, as I think we all know, is inappropriately cut nails. And I'm going to teach you some of the tricks so that you can do it appropriately and keep the patient safe as long as possible between toenail cuttings because as we all know they can't get in to see us as often as we'd like them to be able to these days. 
So what I'm talking about is here, they, you were seeing the nail go down, excuse me, the cut go down into the sides uh, of the nail, the border of the nail. You have to go all the way down. Would it be okay to leave this toenail the way it is now? Yes, it would. But I want to teach you the most professional way to do it and the way that will keep the patient uh, safe from infection the longest. Here's your clipper. Now, I did say, this is just a photograph, just to show you that we're going all the way out to the edge of the nail. As I said, I'm not normally putting the entire nail into the uh, entire length of the jaw of the clipper, but just to the very end of it. So realize this is just a photo to show you it going all the way out to the end. Here again is the curette. We're freeing up underneath. We're making sure we did a good job. Realize that the uh, toenails, grow way deeper than what you're seeing. So that when you're cutting down that edge, you need to make sure that you are going far enough to get to the very edge of the nail, even if that is under the skin. And that's part of where the curette comes in. It helps you feel down under there to make sure you've done it when you can't actually see it. This is what happens if you don't. If you go just as far as maybe you can see or you think you've gone far enough and you leave this little spike, which is fine that day, but as the nail grows out, this becomes a spike and it lacerates the tissue and then bacteria pour in. That is an ingrown toenail and you have created it. So you need to make sure you've gone all the way to the edge of this uh, nail before you stop cutting. That's the only safe way to do it. So here's a little picture of it to show you. You've not gone all the way to the edge where the nail grows because it's hidden under the skin. So as that nail advances over the next couple of weeks, it lacerates the skin and becomes ingrown. And that's how this forms. This is inappropriate nail cutting. Now, does that mean we don't take the risk of cutting it appropriately down into the border like that? No, we're going to learn how to do that. Here's a situation where this is fine today, but this is growing up into that nail and going to cause this to become infected. So we need to cut this down, not into the skin, that's just the way this line goes, to show you you're actually going down deep into that uh, crevice down in there and getting the entire border out, rounding it off so that it can grow out appropriately. Dystrophic nails. The sander, the Dremel, you can get a Dremel anywhere, Fred Meyer, Sears, Handyman stores. It's a, it's a hobby drill and it comes with different um, bits that are for hobby um, skills, woodworking and that sort of thing. Uh, there are different kinds of things that people use with the Dremel when they're doing nail care. There are diamond burrs that are shaped like, uh, kind of like teardrops. There are um, different kinds of scored metal burrs. I like to use these sanding discs. They're cheap, they're disposable, so with each person you don't have to worry about um, doing any disinfecting, you just throw this away. Uh, they're easily good enough one disc to go through uh, tin toenails. Um, they're cheap. The problem is they are not readily available. You really have to go through a podiatry or a foot care specialty supply house to get them. You also need a special shank to put them on the Dremel, but they are fabulous. I know there's some controversy about the nail dust that a Dremel kicks up, and we're going to cover that in another uh, webcast about myconic nails. But realize that, yes, it kicks up particulate matter. If you have asthma, any kind of lung problems like that, it's a problem. You need to wear a mask or not do this particular kind of procedure. But it does not have any potential whatsoever to create fungal infections in the lungs. I know that's the common thought. There is nothing in the literature ever in history to show that you can get a fungal pulmonary infection from the sanding uh, aerosolization from uh, nails, even mycotic nails. So if you have to work with that in your facility, you know, look at that webcast so you can get more into detail of it. But I love it and I can't do my nail care appropriately without a sander. So in a nail like this, the, the proximal edge is fine. You just need the distal edge. It's already short enough. There's nothing you can really do with a clipper on this. You need to sand it. So you're going to just 
very gently sand the edge of that, make that smooth and bevel down, make it nice and pretty so that it not only looks better, but it's going to grow out well and not catch on socks or, or rip off uh, before the person can get back to see you again. Similar situation is mostly just distally, although these are a little bit longer than I'd like them to be. I'd like this to be down about there. But with most thick nails, what I'm going to do is sand it first. It's so much easier to clip it appropriately if it's thinner. You can't clip a nail appropriately if it's too thick. And it tends to split and crumble and make it very difficult for you. So I would sand these nails first, make them thinner on the distal portion. I might even sand it more proximally here just to make that smoother. It's kind of a ridged nail. Then I would cut it as short as I wanted it and then do a final little sand just to make it very uh, soft at the end, uh, smooth rather. I don't want it to be um, craggly at the end after I've cut it. I always, as a very last step, uh, sand it to make it smooth at the very tip. Some nails only grow tall. They don't grow long at all. This nail does not grow long anymore. It only grows tall. You can do a little bit uh, with the clipper, I suppose, uh, if you needed to, to get this down a little thinner. But this is about a half inch tall. I don't know if you can tell that in this picture. You really have to sand it. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult and time consuming to do that with a manual sander. So this is a perfect example of something that gets fixed within a minute uh, once you know how to do it with the sander. So this would be a sanding situation. How far down can you sand it? You can sand it down to skin. There is just normal skin underneath nails. Now I'm not suggesting you have to do it this far down. This is just for demonstration so you can see that you can do it that far down. I like to get the nails as thin as possible. That's the way the person is the safest from shoe pressure on a thick nail, which is painful if they're not neuropathic, but also can create infections and ulcerations. Those half inch and quarter inch thick nails with shoes that aren't appropriately extra depth cause a lot of pressure and can cause problems. So I get them as thin as possible. I do warn the patient if I thin it a lot that it's going to be sensitive for a couple of days, but then it'll be fine. What's the worst case scenario if you thin it too far? You kind of scratch the skin the same way you would if you use the Dremel up here. You're just going to create a scratch. It's not a cut. It's not anything difficult. Even if the person is on blood thinners, it usually doesn't bleed very much. Although I admit I have silver nitrate sticks in my kit to, so that I can handle any bleeding. But for the most part, you finish what you're doing, you clean it up appropriately with betadine or whatever your local, your, your favorite antiseptic is. You might then put a topical antibiotic and a band-aid on it. It's fine. Even a very high risk person, it's fine. So do you have to make it as thin as this picture is showing? No, but I want you to know that that's doable without any problems. What about this kind of nail where it's curved like this? That's called either an omega nail or a pincer nail. How do you cut a dystrophic nail like that? Well, you can't cut it straight across. It's not straight across. So you have to aim the direction of your clippers, the direction the nail is at that spot. So remember, we're going to be taking two or three millimeter nips. So nip, nip, nip. And you're changing the direction of the clipper all the way around as you go. So it might take 15, 20 nips to get all the way around this, and you're changing the angle of incident of the clipper the entire way around. It does not hurt to cut toenails. If your patient is in pain, you've done something wrong. You've either held the clipper at the wrong angle, you've nipped them with the clipper, you have um, used the curette too aggressively, Things don't usually bleed and things don't usually hurt if you do toenail appropriately, even with the most difficult dystrophic nails. So with these uh, angled, these curved omega nails, be sure to move the clipper in the same direction as the nail is at that spot. So you can't go straight across. That would lift up this edge, which would be painful. You have to start here and change the direction of the clipper as you go around. Same for all of these. Very thick nails. You could do some stuff with clippers with these if you don't have access or, or the skills with yet with a Dremel, although I, I, you need to start trying with it. Um, this would can be taken care of in just minutes with the Dremel. You can do it with a manual sander. It just takes a very long time. 
So if you don't have access to a Dremel, what you might do is just clip it as best you can across, not just the end, but the top as well, kind of like you're sculpting, get it down as far as you can, and use a manual uh, sanding um, blade, no, excuse me, not blade, a sanding uh, emery disc or something like that to do paddle, excuse me, to sand the rest of it. That's a safe way to do it too. It just takes a lot longer. So my favorite way to do this is with a Dremel. And you can see how far down you get them. That is so safe. That person can go for months without getting foot care. And they're extremely safe. They're not going to get ingrown. They're not going to get pressure sores. And you can see from this skin, look how thin this skin is. Very dry, thin, atrophic skin. You can tell by the way this skin looks that this person does not have great vascular supply. So you want to do the maximum you can to create a safe situation for this person. This is the same toe from the side. You can see how tall that is. So if you were having to use clippers, maybe you're going to clip, clip, clip to get all this debulked off and then use a manual sander to make it flatter. But I like to just do it with the Dremel. They can even polish this when you're done. I don't care. We're not trying to solve uh, onychomycosis here. Um, there's a separate video on fungal nails, and you'll learn a lot about that. But what you will learn is that we can't cure it. We're, we're going to do is make the patient safe, and that's what we're doing here. So grind those down any way you can, as far as you can, and keep them safe. Thanks for watching this. I hope it helps you feel more confident in your nail care. You've seen some examples of difficult nails that are actually very easy to treat. Remember that nail care is not bloody. It is not painful if it's done properly. You might check our website. We do have some hands-on nail courses that we offer, as well as longer uh, full-day WOCN certified toenail courses. So you can check on the website for that. But I hope you go out and, and right now and start doing nail care. You're medical professionals. These people need your help to do this. And they love you for it. It's a real win-win situation. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to seeing you on another program. Bye.